this in one voice, we cry hope. Well, Merry Christmas. You can have a seat. Welcome to Johnson Ferry. My name is Lee Taylor, and it is a privilege to have each and every one of you here. If you are a guest, we're really excited that you're here. In fact, we have a little QR code that is on our welcome guide that you can scan, and that's a great way to get connected to us and us to you, maybe answer some questions you might have about who we are as a church. Around here, we say that we exist as a church to help people find truth, belonging, and purpose in Jesus Christ. And if that's curious to you, if you're interested in that, we'd love to talk some more. So fill that out, or you can meet us out in the atrium today. Also wanna let you know that on January 7th, we're kicking off a brand new sermon series called Things That Stick. Things That Stick. And so we're gonna look at things that really matter in life, things that really matter in life, and how to pass those things on to the next generation. So you don't wanna miss that. Great way to kick off the new year, January 7th. And then uh, today is Sunday. It's just a normal day for us around here. And, and uh, for our church members, just wanna remind you that one of the ways that we love to worship is through our giving. It's great just to pause and reflect on all the ways that Jesus has blessed us uh, throughout the week. And so just giving a portion back to him is just one of the ways that we worship here. And so you can get more information about that at johnsonferry.org slash give. If you're a visitor today, no obligation, no pressure to give, uh, but we just love doing that as a church. Now, do we have any kids in the room? Yeah, yeah. You guys got plans tomorrow? Anything going on tomorrow? Yeah? Oh, Christmas, oh, okay. All right, how about this? On the count of three, you tell me what you want for Christmas and then I'll tell you. All right, ready? One, two, three. Horse. Horse. Yeah. I feel like we should bring back the horse. You know, I feel like bringing your horse to work day should be something we should all be praying about in uh, 2024. So, well, I do have a gift for you kids. It's going to be right up here on the screen. So, why don't you check out this video? Hello everyone, my name is Professor Brilecki. Now I have some very special helpers with me and we are gonna be talking about something that everybody talks about around Christmas time, magnets! You, you all don't talk about magnets every year around Christmas time? Maggie the Christmas magnet? Uh, strange, the coolest thing about magnets is that they attract or draw things to themselves. This is cool, but what does this have to do with Jesus? 
That is a really great question, Noah, and I have the perfect experiment to help answer that question. Slime! Slime! Yes! And so now, let's start making our own slime. We're gonna start by adding one half cup of water with one half cup of school glue, one half teaspoon of baking soda. And while we're doing that, I think it's time for us to figure out or talk about why people are so drawn to Christmas. The reason for Christmas is Jesus. In fact, Jesus is our contact to Christmas, which reminds me, getting back to our recipe, we need to slowly add our contact solution. And when you're done with that, to have some fun, you can actually add a little bit of food coloring. And while you're mixing that up, I think that we should check in to learn how Jesus is our contact for Christmas and how he draws people to himself. Suddenly, a great company of the heavenly hosts appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven, and on earth peace to those on whom his favor rests. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. Wow! Did you hear that? The shepherds hurried, the Bible says, to go find Jesus. They went just after the angels told them about Jesus. Yes, Marina. The angels told them that Jesus had been born, and off the shepherds went to find him. Now, how are your mixtures coming along? Are they getting slimy? Mm-hmm. Okay, well, now I think it's time for us to go ahead and start to knead our slime, and then we're gonna carefully add one tablespoon of iron filling. Mix that in. Now, as we're working on that, I think that we need to hear a little bit more about how Jesus draws people to him at Christmas. Where is the one who has been born, King of the Jews? We saw his style when it rose and have come to worship him. After they had heard the king, they went on their way, and the star they had seen in the east went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. Did you hear that? Magi, or wise men, they followed a star a great distance to get to Jesus. Talk about a magnetic personality. I mean, even at Jesus' birth, people were drawn to him. Wise men were drawn to him. The next thing I want to do is I want you guys to take these neodymium magnets and hold them over that slime. You see, as you get close to the slime, it starts to move the slime. Let's think about this in connection with what we just learned about Jesus. From the beginning at his birth, Jesus was drawing people to himself. We are drawn to Christmas like a magnet pulls things in because we're drawn to Jesus. And the closer we get to him, the more we're drawn to him. The more we learn about him and know him, the more we come to love him. And so my prayer for you this Christmas is that you will draw closer to Jesus so that you can experience his great and magnetic love. So glad you're here. Parents, we're glad that you're also here. And people who have no kids, we're glad that you're here too. Um, incredible just to see how Jesus draws us in. Um, that's why we're gathered here. And we want to look at the word as we continue just to look at how people waited expectantly for the one who would come to draw us all near and truly show us himself. So let's look at the scriptures together. Psalm 27, 14. Wait for the Lord. Be strong. And let your heart take courage. Wait for the Lord. Lamentations 3, 25 says, The Lord is good to those who wait for him, to the soul who seeks him. Psalm 33, 20 through 22. Our soul waits for the Lord. He is our help and our shield. For our heart is glad in him because we trust in his holy name. Let your steadfast love, O Lord, be upon us, even as we hope in you. Isaiah 7, 14. Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, a virgin will be with child and bear a son and she will call his name Emmanuel. Yes. Isaiah 9, 6. 
For unto us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Luke 3, 15 through 16. Everyone was expecting the Messiah to come soon, and they were eager to know whether John might be the Messiah. John answered their questions by saying, I baptize you with water, but someone is coming soon who is greater than I am, so much greater that I am not even worthy to be his slave and untie the straps of his sandals. Luke 2, 11. Today in the town of David, a savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. The woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming, he who is called Christ. When he comes, he will tell us all these things. Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. Let's stand together as we all sing, rejoice, rejoice. Rejoice, rejoice.
give you all the glory. We'll give you all the glory. We'll give you all the glory. We'll give you all the glory. Christ the Lord. We'll praise your name forever. Come on, let's sing. just grateful and thankful. Lord, may you get all the glory. We love you. We'll praise your name forever and ever. And the people all said, amen. Amen. Y'all can grab a seat. Just about everyone likes receiving gifts at Christmas. Some we definitely like more than others. Here's looking at you, pink bunny suit. Did you know Jesus also got gifts for Christmas? Can you remember what he got? Well, for starters, it wasn't a drum solo from the Little Drummer Boy. In fact, Jesus received gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Okay, yeah, so gold, that's awesome. Who wouldn't love that? But frankincense and myrrh, what even are those? Maybe it's time to take a closer look at these gifts that the wise men brought Jesus. What exactly do they represent and how do they relate to us today? Merry Christmas Eve to you. We're so grateful to have you at Johnson Ferry. I want to welcome not only everyone here in our activity center, but also to the folks that are right now in our sanctuary gathered. Yeah, it's so good to be with you. In case I haven't had the pleasure of meeting you, my name is Clay, and I'm the pastor here at Johnson Ferry. And not only am I a pastor, I'm a dad, I'm a husband. And so like you, our family, are, we're in the countdown hours to what is, of course, one of the, one of the big days of the year. Um, anybody got any shopping left to do between now and tomorrow? Anybody? Yeah, can you just, just be honest about that? This was your plan. I'll go to church at 10, and I got all day. Uh, so, well done. But we're, we're gearing up for the big day. Love Christmas. It's been an awesome Christmas season here at Johnson Ferry. And we love to have folks who come at Christmas Eve. I, I know there are a lot of you where uh, maybe you haven't been here since last Christmas Eve. Uh, we're still here, and we're grateful uh, that you've come back again this year and excited about today. Excited about lighting candles and the, and the things that we come to Christmas Eve to do. But I thought we'd have a few moments to reflect on the meaning of Christmas, and I would love a little bit of audience participation from you. So if you could help me with something. I'm just curious because I don't know who's in the room or in our rooms, I should say. I don't know who's all here. So maybe just give me a, a little feel for who I'm talking to this morning. I have a couple of questions. We're going to call it a this or that, right? No wrong, no wrong answers. Just if you had to choose between this Christmas thing or this Christmas thing, which, which one would you choose? So let's just kind of run through these real quick. Number one, would you rather have hot chocolate or hot cider? Say it out loud. Which one? Okay, yep. Okay, yeah, cider's clearly the answer. All right, uh, number two, uh, white lights or colored lights? This is... Okay, this is a debate in our family as well. How about this third one, um, real tree or artificial tree? Mm -hmm. Yep. I got to be honest, we switched to artificial maybe four years ago, and I'm, I'm not going back. I love it. I love it. I'm a, I'm a convert to synthetic trees. All right, uh, number four, star topper or the angel on top? Any? Gotcha. Gotcha. Actually, our artificial tree hits our ceiling, so we, we can do neither. So I don't know about you, but... Um, all right, how about this one? Would you rather live in a snow globe or live in a gingerbread house? Mm. That's right, gingerbread house. You could eat your way out of it. It's great. Well, these are all fun things to think about Christmas, but here, here's a real serious one. And this one, I, don't, I want you to answer, but you don't need to do it out loud. And here's the, the final this or that. Would you rather give a gift or receive a gift? Oh, hold on now. It's a little conflicted. You're thinking, do I lie in church? Do, do I? Because you know the right answer. 
Well, all, all Christmas, we've been talking about gift giving, and we've been in a message series called The Gift, where we have been looking at the wise men who came to give gifts to Jesus that first Christmas, and we've talked about the different meanings of those gifts. And Christmas is a time when we certainly give gifts of all different kinds, whether it's to our family members, our loved ones. As a church, it's been a real blessing to see you give all year. In fact, uh, this Christmas, we were able to give as a church uh, close to half a million dollars to a number of causes locally, across the world, helping people in need. What, a, what an incredible gift you have been to give all year round uh, to the ministry of Johnson Ferry. But actually today, I don't want to talk to you about the gifts that we give. I want to reflect just a few minutes with you about gifts given to us by God. Now, I know you're thinking, look, I've been to church. I know we're about to go with this. Uh, you're going to talk about Jesus is the gift. And yes, I am going to talk about that, but I want to be more specific than simply say Jesus is the gift. In fact, there is a wonderful Bible passage that summarizes the Christmas story. And I don't know if, if you read the Bible, if you have a Bible, maybe you came today and didn't bring one, and that's okay. I'm going to have it on the screen in front of us. But I want to spend just a few minutes reflecting on a short Bible passage of three or four verses that I think gives a wonderful I'll just call it a Cliff Notes version of the Christmas story. Anybody remember Cliff Notes? Remember that? Yeah. Me and Cliff were very close in high school. I, I remember <laughs> Cliff Notes very well. I think this is a wonderful summary of, of the Christmas story. And it's not found in Matthew or Luke, which is where the stories about the angel and the wise men and the manger are found. It's actually found in the book of Galatians. And again, if you don't have a Bible, you don't need to have one in front of you. But if you did, you can turn there with me in Galatians 4. And I want us to read a few verses, reflect on these, and then show you, I think, a wonderful illustration of where these have come to life, and then we're going to light our candles. So if you are physically able, let's stand together as I read for you this passage, and then we'll do a few reflections on it. Galatians chapter 4, this is found in verses 4 through 7. This is what God says here in the Bible. He says, But when the fullness of the time came, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, so that he might redeem those who are under the law, so that we might receive the adoption as sons and daughters. Because you are sons, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying out, Abba, Father, Therefore, you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir through God. Father, as we spend a few moments in the hectic season that is Christmas, help us to just calm down, slow down, and to hear your voice and reflect on how powerful this is, not just for the world, but for each one of us. God, we love you and we thank you. We pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You can have a seat. So this is a fascinating passage, and each and every Sunday when I get up here, I have the real privilege of just reading the Bible like we just did and, and trying to teach it to you. And this passage has so much more depth than the time we're giving it this morning but let me make a few introductory comments about this passage, and then I want to show you what I think are three gifts that God gives to us through Jesus that we should reflect on at Christmas. A few things he says just to set this up. It's interesting. He said in verse 4, but when the fullness of time came. Did you know that Jesus came to Bethlehem at exactly the right time? Now, we're not told why it's the right time. There are a lot of interesting historical things that were going on in Rome, around the world, that made it an optimal time. But it says, when the time had come, the, the word for fullness of time, it gives the word picture of a, of a piece of fruit that's ready to be picked. In God's perfect wisdom, at the right time, it says that he sent his son. Now, that says something that's so important to dwell on, which means that 
that long before Bethlehem, Jesus existed. Now, I know that's hard to get our minds around, but the Bible tells us that Jesus is an equal part of the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So long before Bethlehem, even long before God said, let there be light, Jesus is, Jesus was. And he was sent into the earth. And it says, in the fullness of time, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law. Now, every single person here was born of a woman. If you were not born of a woman, I would like to meet you after the service (laughs) just to shake your hand. But all of us were born of a woman. That doesn't make Jesus unique, but it's, it's, it's Paul's way, and Paul is the human author of this, a way of talking about that that Jesus is God, but he's also man. He's fully God and fully man. Not half man, half God, but fully man and fully God. And and he says the reason that he came, I think in verses five through seven, he gives us three reasons. And these are three very deep yet simple things to understand. And those are what I wanna communicate to you this Christmas. These are gifts I believe that God has given to us in Jesus. The first is that God has given us forgiveness in Jesus. I mean, after all, it says that he came to redeem those who are under the law. The word redeem means to buy back. It was a term of the marketplace. Now, at Christmas time, we think about the marketplace a lot. Certainly, we spend a lot of money. A lot of people go into debt at Christmas. Credit cards love Christmas, uh, because we tend to use them a lot, maybe, maybe to our peril. But when, when Paul was using the word redemption, he wasn't necessarily talking about, you know, buying goods and services. It was actually a word that was used for buying slaves out of bondage into freedom. In the Roman world, a slave's freedom could be purchased at a price by somebody else. So Paul's culture would have been very familiar with that terminology. And he says, here's one of the things that Jesus does, that he buys us out of slavery. Now you're thinking, hold on. First of all, I'm not a slave. So so what does that mean for me? But the reality is, as the Bible tells us, that we are slaves. We don't admit it, but we are slaves of sin. We're slaves of brokenness. And sometimes unknowingly. Uh, Terika, my wife and I went to a movie not too long ago, and um, it's one of those times we went to the movie and we didn't like do a lot of research on the movie or kind of figure it out. It just happened to be playing at the time we were out on a date together and thought, we'll go see this movie. It got, you know, the trailer looked interesting. Well, we got into this movie, and I'm not going to tell you what the movie was, but it was just, it was bad. Like, it, not just like a bad story, but I'm talking like a lot of adult content, a lot of language, a lot of images, a lot of just like, this is just a, kind of a vile movie. And the whole time I'm sitting there thinking, okay, this thing's gonna turn around, it's gonna get better. And it never really did. It just ended kind of dark and depressing. And, and I didn't leave mad because of the things that said or did. I left sad because I thought, th- this is what the world thinks life and meaning and purpose is all about. But we know from experience that the things you're longing for are only found in God. In fact, our mission statement as a church is that we exist to help people find truth, belonging, and purpose in Jesus. Jesus Christ came to redeem us from our slavery to sin, from our bondage to sin. That's why he came. You know, Jesus came in a manger, the incarnation. But of course, Jesus grew up and would die on a cross for our sins. And and we're reminded of just how much God loves us as Jesus hung there on a cross with his arms open wide. It's a symbolic way of Jesus saying, I'm dying for the whole world, each and every single one of you, to forgive you of your sin and to bring you back into a relationship with me, to redeem you from sin and with the purchase price of his blood to buy you back so that you might come to God. Jesus Christ died for our sins and was raised from the dead. And now as reigning Lord, Jesus offers forgiveness of sin and the liberating gift of the Holy Spirit to those who would put their trust, their life in his hands. Jesus had to be both man and God 
to accomplish this. I mean, if I lived 2,000 years ago, I, I guess I could have died on a cross, but I'm not God. I don't have the power to forgive sin. But Jesus did not die on the cross merely as God. No, he also died as a man to redeem us. And if you want to study this further, I just, I wrote down in my own notes some of the benefits of redemption. See, when we come to Christ, we're given, well, we're given eternal life. We're given forgiveness of sin. We're given righteousness. We're given freedom from the curse of the law. We're given deliverance from sin's bondage. We're given peace with God. How many people would love to have peace with God? We're given the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. One of the great gifts of God is redemption in Christ. You know, in a little while, we're going to sing Silent Night. And sometimes we gloss over the words, but I love this phrase in Silent Night. Silent night, holy night, son of God, love's pure light, radiant beams from thy holy face with the dawn of redeeming grace, forgiveness. So the first gift is forgiveness. The second gift is the gift of family. The Bible tells us here not only that we're redeemed, but that we might receive the adoption as sons and daughters. Adoption is really the application of redemption. And it shows up in the Christmas story in ways you probably never thought about. Like, for instance, I bet you've heard the name Caesar Augustus. It shows up in the Christmas story as the reigning Caesar at the time. Well, I don't know how much you remember from your Roman history, but Caesar Augustus, his name was Octavian. His grand uncle, great uncle that is, was Julius Caesar. And the interesting thing historically is that they weren't actually blood related. Uh, Octavian's father won a war and as a reward for the war that he won, Julius Caesar adopted his son and made him the ruler. So if you were living in that time to be adopted into the, a powerful Roman family, it's, I mean, it's like winning the lottery. So adoption is this metaphor where once you're given rights of this family, you're given all the status and privilege of that family. And here's the great thing about the gospel, the the good news of God, that when we come in Jesus to God, he adopts us as sons and daughters. You know, we say that all the time, like, hey, we're all God's children. And I know we we mean well by that. But did you know that's not actually true? Now, yes, we're all created in the image of God. God loves us all. God created us all in his image, but we're not actually all the children of God until we come to him through Jesus. And he adopts us as his sons and daughters. We, we have some good family friends who have adopted a child this last year. And I can't imagine what this Christmas is going to be like for that adopted child who's experiencing the privileges of that family in a way that child has never experienced before. And that's the same thing when we come to God through Jesus. We are adopted as his sons and daughters. And it says, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying out, Abba, Father, which was a term of endearment. So we don't have to just say God is a higher power. God is the man upstairs. No, no, no. We can can say, no, God is my dad. You know, a lot of you grew up with earthly fathers that were wonderful. A lot of you grew up with earthly fathers that were really tough. And maybe Christmas has brought out some of that strained relationship. But can I tell you that you have a perfect heavenly father who loves you and who wants to adopt you as his son and as his daughter? One of the great gifts of God at Christmas is not just forgiveness, though that's powerful. It's family, that we're part of God's family. Well, here's the third thing, the third gift, favor. So forgiveness family, and favor. Notice in verse 7, it says that, therefore, you are no longer a slave, but a son. And you could, of course, say a daughter. And if a son, then an heir through God. I I use the word favor because favor means something like um, demonstrated delight. That, yes, you may like all people, even love all people, but you have favor for your wife, your husband, your kids. You have this demonstrated delight for someone. You take pride in them. You delight in them. You connect with them in a way you, connect, you don't connect with other people. You honor them in a way you don't honor other people. They are given your favor. And did you know that the Bible tells us here that if we come to God through Jesus, we're not only a son, we're an heir, which means everything God wants to give us 
He grants us through Jesus. The word heir is the same word for someone who would take care of, of a plot of land. Now imagine if you bought land, you would care for it, prune it, keep it looking good. In a way, that's what God does with us. He cares for us. And he gives us the power of his Holy Spirit. I love that the Trinity is in this passage. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Now the thing that I've noticed about God is that he loves to change people's lives. And I don't know how it works. I really don't. It's a miracle. Anytime comes, anyone comes to Jesus, I don't know how it works, it does. And this last year, it's been a privilege as a pastor just seeing a number of people whose lives God has radically changed. And on Christmas Eve, I think it's powerful to just celebrate life change. And today I wanna to share with you a story about someone whose life was changed starting at Christmas Eve last year. And I wanna show you this for two reasons. Number one, because I want you to see the incredible power of God to change a life. And number two, I believe there are a lot of people here that are supposed to be here this morning to hear about Jesus, to identify with this story, and for you to make the same decision in your life. So let's check out how God changed a life this past Christmas. My name is Lynn Iglar, and a year ago, everything changed for me. I grew up in New Jersey, and my parents brought me to church, and I went through the process of, you know, I was baptized, communion, confirmation, but I never really had a true relationship with Jesus, but I just know that I was supposed to believe in God. Uh, my parents, you know, they always told me that if I want to achieve something in life, that I had to make a list, I had to work hard. I got a full scholarship to Northeastern University in Boston. I finished it at the top of my class. I was awarded a distinguished military graduate. I was given my first choice of assignment. And I thought, this is gonna be it. Um, but it really wasn't. And I uh, eventually decided to get out of the Army. And so I got out and I thought, all right, how am I gonna be successful? I got a job as a financial advisor. I was gonna help other people with their list of what they wanna do, but I was also gonna check off my own boxes, which is have financial freedom and be able to do what I wanna do whenever I wanted to do it. During the time, I met a fantastic woman, Heather. And we have two sons now. And uh, like every good dad, I was supposed to get involved in the kids' lives. And I went to coaching and help them out, help them become better at what they wanted to achieve, there's still something missing. So I thought maybe it's my own physical, I need to push myself physically. I decided to do Ironman. I did seven Ironmans. I finished it as an all-world athlete. You know, I thought this is the pinnacle, but I still was, wasn't happy. I was still stressed about everything because I'm now I'm trying to, you know, I was getting up early in the morning, going to work out, I was getting the kids to the bus stops. I was coaching after school. Then I turned the news on, and there's nothing but death and destruction everywhere that you look at. And I really started wondering, like, is this what life's all about? There's got to be something else there. I've checked off all the boxes. My list is complete. Why am I not happy? Why am I still stressed about so much? What else am I supposed to do? And then one year ago today, on Christmas Eve, everything changed. We always go to church on Christmas and Easter because you're supposed to go on Christmas and Easter. I thought I was checking off the box. And I remember sitting up in the, in the pew and looking at my family. I don't know what the pastor was saying. I didn't know the pastor's name at the time. Sorry, Clay. But I heard it. I looked at my family and it was a clear voice that said, Len, you're going in the wrong direction. You need to follow me. 
And you know, at first I thought like, what do you mean the wrong direction? I'm doing all the right things. I'm supposed to be doing all the right stuff. And the light turned on for me. Service ended. I grabbed a Bible from the pew and brought it home. I opened it up and started to read. You know, and I, I continued to read and then I, I filled out uh, a card and I met Lee. And we started getting together once a week for eight weeks and just talking about some scripture. It was amazing what I was reading and that the, the living Bible, I, I get it, it's talking to me. So many things that are going on in my life that's right there in the Bible. When I look back on this last year, I realize that so many things have changed. I'm not stressed. I mean, we all have life problems, but I don't walk alone. He walks with me. He walks with my family. I thanked him for allowing me to check off all those boxes that I thought was what was gonna bring me happiness. Those boxes are great. Those are blessings and gifts. I realized the gift he gave me was the gift of salvation. I can remember driving my son to guitar practice and he told me, Dad, you've changed. He told me I changed for the better. He told me I'm calmer, I'm not as stressed. I told him what I was doing and that Christ was making a difference inside of me. He was changing me. So I know there's probably a few of you out there that are just like me, who are checking off their list come into service today because that's what you're supposed to do. But I'm here to tell you that when you look at things through the lens of Christ, everything changes. My list is completely different now. So my prayer for you today is that if you haven't accepted Jesus, that you would allow him into your life today. I did that a year ago today and everything changed for the better. Isn't that great? Love that. I love, uh, I, love, I love Lynn. I love his story. And I think that speaks to all of us. And I believe that's why a lot of you are here. You know, Lynn is getting to experience his first real Christmas, understanding what this whole thing's about. It's not just about a baby in a manger. It's about how that baby grew up and Jesus fulfilled all that he was intended to do on this earth. And right now is reigning and ruling and drawing people through his spirit to himself. And I believe he's speaking to a lot of you this morning. And I believe like a lot, like Lynn, you're, you're trying to check boxes in our very performance-oriented achievement culture, and yet you are empty. And I'm here to tell you that fulfillment you're looking for, the way we talk about it, that truth, belonging, and purpose you're longing for is only found in Jesus. And our prayer is that you would receive the gift of Christ this morning, that you would turn from your way, that you would do what the Bible says, which is to repent of your sin, to ask for forgiveness, to confess that he's the Lord and ask him to come into your life and to change you. And he will, and he will. We as a church would love to walk with you on that journey. And I know it's a chaotic morning. We're not asking people to come down forward or any of that kind of thing, but there is a just very simple way that we could begin this process with you, similar to how we did with Lynn. And that's for you to let us know that you would like to follow Jesus. And so whether you do it right after you leave or even right now or later today, uh, I want you to go to the QR code that you were given and it'll take you to a page that looks like this and you can simply check that box, following Jesus. And if that's a box that you need to check, uh, we would love to get in touch with you in the very near future and begin to walk with you. Christmas is about God's rescue plan through Jesus to come to the world and to save us. That he is the light and the light overcomes the darkness. So now we're gonna do, which is one of our favorite things to do at Christmas, 
and that is to light our candles. And I would ask that in both rooms, our deacons who are great servants who are gonna come and get in place and help distribute the light. I pray that they would come. And what we're gonna do in both rooms is we are going to light our candles as a symbolic way of saying, as dark as your life can get, as dark as the world may be, the light of the Christ is greater, amen? The light of Christ is greater. So I wanna pray for you. And then after we pray, we'll begin to distribute the light and reflect on Jesus as the light of the world. Father, we love you and we thank you for Jesus. And Lord, I do pray, God, if there's anyone here today, this morning, that Lord needs to give their life to you, that needs to turn from their way and turn towards you, as you've done with Lynn, as you've done with countless others. God, would your spirit do a powerful work today, God, that would change their life forever. God, only you can change a life, Lord Jesus, and you do it by the power of your spirit. So God, would your spirit do a miracle right now and help someone cross from death to life, the cross from being in bondage to the kingdom of darkness to Lord being a son in the house of light. God, would you do a great work? And Lord, as we light these candles, it is a symbolic way of thinking about the light of Christ emanating from that cradle to the cross, Lord, to the resurrection and the ascension of Jesus. And Lord, the light of Jesus spreading from our mouths and lives across this dark planet, as we remember that no matter how dark it can get, the light is always, always stronger. So thank you, Jesus, for being the light. It is in your name that we pray and in your name that we sing. Amen.
Well, as we blow out our candles, and yes, I used to be that kid, as we blow out our candles, um, what a glorious reminder of all that Jesus is and all that he's done. We are so blessed to have you on this wonderful Christmas Eve. Uh, we love to connect with you. Again, I think we'll be out in the pergola. If you want to talk to someone, look for someone with a red name tag, we would love to connect with you. But before you leave, before you leave, it's not enough to sing Silent Night. We need to reflect on the joy that Jesus has brought, amen? The joy to the world. So let's sing joy to the world. 